Okay. So, yeah, good morning, everybody, and um, hope you had a nice, uh, good sleep last night. Who here slept well last night? In, uh, half of them. Good, good. So we are on a good start. Um, yeah, today I will speak about uh, why we should all be hyped about inclusive leadership. And I'm really honored to be here to do that. Um, I am at my first in person, EuroPython. I attended EuroPython two years ago remotely on the diversity and inclusion panel. I was the uh, one remote. And um, uh, that, was, that was fun. So thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me and also for all the attendees that are here today. This talk was a little bit challenging to prepare because I am used to talking about diversity, inclusion, and leadership to the people that usually show up to those events, which are, well, women, um, people from minority background, uh, underrepresented in tech. So today is a little bit more diverse uh, audience, a different type of diverse. So who here is the first time at a diversity and inclusion style event talk? Anybody? Yeah, some. Cool. So welcome and um, hope by the end of this talk you will be inspired to attend many more events like this at conferences. Because at every conference there is, there are events like this. Uh, Christian already introduced me, so my pronouns are she, her. I am an inclusive data leadership coach. I've been working in data for a lot of years and also in leadership and in the Python community. And I also do artsy stuff with dinosaurs, so today there is going to be a dinosaur in the room. And um, I, yeah, I'm giving this talk because I think we have, like as a society, we have a problem. According to a study in the UK last year, 82% of people who enter management have no proper training. And that is something that is accepted by companies um, so it's a systemic problem because then, like, all the way to the top, nobody really gets training. And people believe that all you have to do in order to be a good uh, manager or a good leader is to have been a successful principal software developer before. And um, having written good code transfers to being able to manage people instantly. Um, the same research says that uh, one in three people quit those managers. <laughs> so don't be like that, maybe, or try to um, see how not to do that. Oops, sorry. So this talk is a little bit about what can we do to change that. It's a start. There is another problem, the diversity problem, at least in Europe, um, and I think it's everywhere. Um, women are not really represented in the um, senior management positions. It's getting better, but we're not there yet. And um, looking at politics and so on, the current trends are not looking like things are getting better, so we, sh we still have some work to do. My two friends today are going to be James and Mary. They are called James and Mary by pure popularity of the names um, in the United States, still the most popular names over the last uh, 100 years. I will not, this are, these are not real people. They are buckets of behaviors. So do not, um, I'm not calling out any James, right? I'm actually calling in people who maybe identify a little bit like James or like Mary and um, as I'm reading, down, right, wrote down there that all the characters and events in this talk, even those based on real people, are entirely fictional. Yeah? Let's start with James. Um, statistically speaking, we are all here um, either developers or data people, so we like to average things. So on average, um, it turns out that James is probably a white man, and uh, he, let's say, has been working as a data scientist for six years, and then was promoted to principal, and then promoted to leadership without any training. 
the only places he learned leadership from was school and life, what he observed. Probably his managers also didn't really have a lot of leadership training, so it's just been this rolling effect. James is then doing the default thing, which is relying on authority to, to manage and to lead. He is also respecting people higher in the authority structure more than the people lower. You cannot really contradict James. I mean, you can, but it might have uh, consequences to your own career and your progression. And when James makes decisions for the team, he doesn't really involve the team, and the, the team is not really invited to counter or give counter opinions to the decisions. James, unfortunately, also likes to, count, to micromanage because this is, I mean, like any teacher in school back then, you know, was micromanaging. That's like we learned it from kindergarten. And in order to micromanage successfully, you have to keep the team in the dark. You have to control the information. You cannot share all the information. Otherwise, micromanaging would be like unsuccessful. He also doesn't give actionable feedback. The kind of feedback that he gives to an employee is like, nice work, or you're nice, or you're nice, but I cannot promote you now because, well, you still need to do some more nice stuff. The word nice is a good word. And he also doesn't accept feedback, obviously, because if you can't give feedback, you can't accept feedback and he has a punitive approach to mistakes. Blame culture is the thing that, is the default thing that we have around, right? And obviously you don't really trust James because if you think, you feel like if you tell James about your personal issues that you have at home or like personal things in the team that are bothering you, this might be taken and used against you. My question to you here is, who knows a James? Who has worked for a James? Currently, okay, I'm so sorry. Okay, who, who's looking for a new job because they are kind of working, don't, <laughs> so, yeah. okay, good. This kind of leadership is called the command and control. Um, all of the things that I listed there are given by um, uh, Lama, um, so language model. I asked the language model, okay, what are the behaviors of a command and control leader? And those, what I said earlier, what's everything that ChatGPT already knows. And this kind of leadership just does not work anymore. Uh, people like to work in environments that enable them to grow and be great and expect personalized leadership. Going to work and expecting your people are all the same and gonna be the same every day and have the same needs all the time is not what people expect. And honestly, as I asked earlier, if people don't like it at work today, they are looking to move. They have options. So what happened like 50 years ago where there was in Europe this concept of job for life, this is not really a thing anymore. Is there any hope for James? Who here thinks there's hope for James? Good. Who here thinks when, you're, when you've worked for James, were you, I'm going to help this manager change? <laughs> See, so this is, this is the, why it's good, like whenever we have some Jamesonian thing going on that we are looking for help and, you know, it's self, we have to, you know, we have to do like the dinosaurs did. Even the dinosaurs can change. I know that this is a tech conference, so everybody who I ask apparently already knew this fact, but the T-Rex is now a chicken. So, Think about it when you eat chicken today. And uh, so the T-Rex has managed over, I don't know, 65 billion years, I don't know how many years, to become 
the most predominant bird on the planet. From, a, from, those, from the perspective of species, it's quite successful because there's a lot of chickens. Of course, we don't care about the happiness or anything of anybody, so that's not the point. T-Rex didn't know any better. Okay, so maybe you recognize some of the James behaviors also in yourself and you're now thinking, okay, I do not have one billion years. So start today. Let's talk about Mary. We talked about James. So Mary is someone who has some behaviors we would want to have. She's a leader who might actually not even have authority. Could be even a product owner. They are leaders, but they don't have authority. Could be a senior developer, a senior data scientist. She has to lead with influence. And even if she has authority, she would still lead with influence. She does not want to rely on her, on her authority, and she is even recognizing any biases that she might have because of authority struct hierarchical structures. She's also respecting people independent of their status and the education they have, and I don't know how many pull requests they did. And she also appreciates being contradicted. She sees being contradicted as a way to avoid mistakes and learn. Because, I mean, you're, think about it, you're a manager, you're gonna go and tell something to a board meeting and your employee tells you, oh no, that's wrong. It's good not to make a fool of yourself. She also has a more complex decision-making model. She sometimes decides with the team, decides for the team. Either way, the team trusts that her decisions took their opinions and their perspective in mind and they're still challengeable decisions. Of course, Mary does not do micromanaging unless it's absolutely necessary, but she's rather empowering people to be autonomous and is open for feedback and is, she is giving actionable feedback. This is something you should learn in like specific and not just be a nice sir developer. <laughs> and She's showing vulnerability. She's like a human at work. So she's making, um, she's open about the mistakes she's been making with the team and creates an environment where mistakes are seen as opportunity for growth and learning. And then the question is, have you met a Mary? Have you ever worked for a Mary? Good. How did it make you feel working? for someone like that. Great. Did it even, did you ever like even follow that Mary to another company? <laughs> See, so it's the opposite effect. So this is what I call inclusive leadership, which is a new way of leadership that we should all be doing. An inclusive leader is a leader who's understanding themselves and their team, inspires the culture where diverse perspectives and backgrounds are valued. I mean, why else would you hire all those people if you don't want to listen to them? And recognizes the value of diversity to drive innovation and effective performance in the organization. This is already proven, diversity, innovation, and so on. And I was asked um, by Galina <laughs> early yesterday, what is the difference between inclusive leadership and just good leadership? And my counter question, can you really be a good leader while you're having an exclusive mindset? What are the odds that everybody in your team is exactly the same, grew up in exactly the same place, got born in the same year, probably grew up in the same kind of household, happy family, like the leader? <laughs> so that is not really happening anymore. Um, tech world space is changing quite fast. We have diverse teams, we have multi-generational teams, we have neurodiversity, we have cross-functional teams. We need to be able to deal, we are expected to deal with many stakeholders. And the one thing that is constant at work today is change. And on top of that, people's expectations towards work has, have changed. People expect to have a great time at work. 
They want to have Sunday not to be depressed because Monday is coming. They want to have Sunday, oh, I'm going to go and work on this thing. That's going to be amazing. Or I'm going to go to a conference my company is paying for. This is amazing. And they want to feel that despite all the constant change that is coming in the world and the uncertainty that is coming because companies are changing their KPIs once a year, the goals every quarter, and so on. And the thing is that then what happens is that the leaders of today are having this pressure to provide these environments. And can we really do that with the things we learned in school? I don't think so. I think school hasn't really prepared us for much except, you know, being good at math, being good at physics or biology, whatever we learned. And thus, even though dinosaurs had a lot of time, we don't really have a lot of time to, you know, improve ourselves. We, we have to be if we want to be successful. And it starts in school because I think, or in the first tech job that you have, so why is Mary able to do some of the things and James is not? And I think that is because James has probably never been part of a minority in a group. He's not really aware that he's got many implicit, he's not aware of his implicit biases. And James might even think he's unbiased. I'm not even gonna ask in this room who thinks they are unbiased. I don't want to see that. So, <laughs> and the thing is that because of this not being, James is not really aware of their own privilege and the many privileges that he might have and also not aware of the power of those privileges and how many things just went well for James in his life because of that and for other people it didn't. I mean, not until this talk. Today, James is learning about all sorts of sources of privilege. Some of them are a lot more obvious than others. So if you're, a wi if you're white, you have privilege. If you're male, if you're straight, cisgender, if you have no disabilities, if you have a university degree, if you're similar age as your coworkers, if you've never been called a diversity hire, if yeah, that happens, and that is a source of privilege when it doesn't happen to you. Um, if you can code in a programming language, can you imagine how much more privilege you have if you can code in two? And if you do not receive comments about your accent, that is also a source of privilege. If you're not interrupted or ignored in meetings, if others don't routinely assume you are a lower seniority level than you are, or that you work in marketing because you went to a tech event and you wear a skirt, or you rec recently received feedback about a technical skill you need to learn. This is something we take for granted, but a lot of people don't receive proper feedback during their career because a lot of the managers managing a lot of people don't have training. And if you have spare time to spend on open source projects or learning new technologies, that is also a source of privilege. You don't have to raise three children, take care of your parents, you don't have to have three jobs. That is a source of privilege. When, so, and the thing is that we are getting assessed and judged based on the surface privileges. Like, I will not really see like on your face if you're interrupted or not in meetings. So that's not really easy. I will also not really see your, uh, many of your disabilities. A lot of people have invisible disabilities. So we get judged by that, but as inclusive leaders, we need to go beyond the surface with the people we work with. Because otherwise, how would we know? When do we start improving our leadership skills? Well, I would say now or yesterday. Um, I think it, having inclusive leadership skills would have helped me a lot more in my career. I switched from academia to industry in 2011, and my first um, data science job in a company in Germany was 
in a team that was run like a software engineering team. It was a data team, but run like, I mean, that's 2011. We had the product owner, we had uh, QA, and they all thought it's software development. And I had a disagreement, I was improving a search engine and I had a disagreement with my PO about how to evaluate search engines. I said, we should evaluate based on precision. He said, we should evaluate based on recall. And I said, but who's gonna scroll down? I could not convince him. And I gave up. I concluded that he doesn't know anything and uh, moved on. I believed that for a very long time about this person, which obviously it's not a very healthy for me to even think about this, you know, beyond that job. And what would I have done differently, right? So first, probably fresh from academia, when I was explaining something about data, I was very technical. <laughs> I'm like so sure that I was like using words that were not really accessible. And the, talking to them was like totally like this. And the other thing is I also didn't know that you should invest in relationships with people at work because it shouldn't be that when you're interacting with a person that works at a higher uh, overview level that they need to know all the details, right? But in order to not needing to know all the details, there needs to be trust. And has this hurt my career? Probably, because let's say my improvement was amazing. I mean, of course. Let's say my improvement was amazing. Had it gone to production, you know, I did it. And that would have been like, I would have been, you know, promoted instantly. And I, of course. So it would have paid off back then to be a bit more aware. I believe that leadership development is a competitive advantage because it's like, if very few people have leadership training, then just getting leadership training makes you m more um, successful. It's like, is it worth becoming a senior software developer if I can stay a junior? Like, nobody's ever asking that question. And we should ask that same question about leadership. Think about getting training for leadership is like a fast, a way to track your learning, fast track your learning, because the other alternative is just waiting for opportunities that life puts in front of you to learn. And you have to have a completely diverse type of conflicts at work, you have to, like, and you might, it might take you five years to get there when it can take you less. Also, when you're approaching it as something that you're learning, it's more like we are approaching it with a beginner mindset. You know you're gonna fail, and that's fine, and you, you want to go through that, that process. Whereas when people are put from a senior position in tech into a leadership position without training, they are expecting to be as good as they were senior developers before when leading people, and there is not a lot of space for failure at work then. And that's a lot of pressure. It's, it's like an unfair system for the person that this happens to and also for the people that get managed by people like that. So my story was that I, I did the training in 2019 when I stepped into leadership. While I was stepping into leadership, about a year later after, so I was leading a data science team, about a year later after that, one of the people in my team came to me and told me that when our manager announced that I was gonna be uh, promoted to leadership, he went to the manager and told him, don't make her a manager, she is terrible. And <laughs> he was telling me this one year later because he's like, well, you proved me wrong. You actually became like a really good manager. And, uh, that was, and I was like super surprised because I honestly thought I was already good in the first place. I didn't really believe that I was that bad. I didn't even identify any of the James-like behavior that I was having. And this is totally, you know, normal, I think. When we, when our mirror is broken or we don't even look in it, then, you know, we, we are perfect. If you're not convinced that we need leadership 
inclusive leadership. My next question is, where do we need inclusive leadership? So I think it's like, you work in a diverse team, you manage diverse teams, you work in cross-functional teams, and here you need leadership, you need to be inclusive because cross-functional means that you work with people that are better at stuff that you have no idea about, and you're good at stuff that they don't have an idea about. So it's, you need to mediate team conflicts, you need to manage your manager. Managing up your manager is the thing that you have to do when managers are not good leaders. You have to understand how your manager is operating, what's important for them, and then trying to kind of make things easy for them to manage you. It's a lot of work, and it takes away from you being advancing technically in your career. And you need to interact with a, a lot of stakeholders, or you need to build products that you don't really use, or you need to build, build products for people that are not like you. Which, if you think about Python, it's open source. A lot of the efforts in the past years were about improving documentation and improving error handling. Because error messages from Python before, like some years ago, were really inaccessible to new learners. You're like, I got, you gotta be an expert at reading stack trace to figure out where the error is. And, and that must have been quite a journey for the core developers to, to really understand as experts, what do beginners need? There, was, there is no way to reset your expertise to go to a beginner mindset about something that you're already an expert about. So you need to maybe, I don't know how they did it. I think Carol mentioned, and she, had a, she mentioned it yesterday. There is a paper about it, some, someone wrote. So inclusive leadership is everywhere. If you, sorry, tell a story. Um, when you can understand and uh, collaborate and you're inclusive in your communication, you can start communicate and work with anybody. When, you work, when you, you're able to work with anybody, your life is a lot easier because you're not like, oh, I can't put that employee to work with the other person because they don't get along. I'm, it's, and when you are understanding people, you're able to manage up because you're understanding your boss, you're valuing and respecting other people that makes you trustable. And when you're influencing with authority, when you learn how to influence with authority, you're much more successful at doing the roles that do not have a lead title in them. Because sometimes you can't just go, hey, do this thing because I said so. I mean, some people do, but yeah. So today I have some scenarios and they might, may or may not be familiar. And I'm gonna ask you to First, think about, okay, uh, what would you do? What would you say? And also, how would you feel if you were the one of the, like the person in the scenario? So the first scenario is one of your employees got stranded from their child for over a year due to COVID restrictions. She's starting to be more and more withdrawn in meetings and at work. She tells her manager, what is going on and asks if they can work for a longer time from outside the country once the restrictions lift. So if you were the manager, what would you say? And also based on this example, what do you think is important to this employee? Getting promoted or seeing their child? Okay, so, I know fictions based on reality. So, James might say something, oh yeah, okay, cool, but I think you can only work for two weeks from another country, sorry, my typo, country. It, this is company policy, period. If you would be in this relationship, in this situation, and then you hear this final statement, how would you, like, how would it feel? And Mary would say something like, okay, I will talk to HR and I will uh, 
talk to HR, and then she goes to talk to HR and then advocates for the employee to get an extended stay because, as we all know, there's, one can always make exceptions at work. Whenever they say, no, we can't make any exceptions, that is, just doesn't exist. And if you think about this, is it, this is not really something to do with inclusive leadership training, the fact that Mary might have more empathy than James. This is sadly having to do more with the fact that Mary was part of a minority, and when you're part of a minority for a long time in a group, you start understanding how the majority functions and how it works, and you start, well, you have to understand the rules of that game, and you need to be able to read the people in the majority, you need to be able to read when they're angry, when they're happy, and that is really building up your emotional intelligence skills. And that's why it is then, so this is part of the feminist standpoint theory that marginalized groups are socially situated in ways that make it more possible for them to be aware of things and ask questions than it is for the non-marginalized people. And this is just, but this is just work. Emotional intelligence can be learned. You practice it, you ask yourself, okay, what could this person need? What could this person want? What's important to them? And even like stopping and saying, okay, what if I put myself in this person's shoes? You don't need to have children to put yourself in the person's shoes. In this case, James didn't have children, but it wasn't because of this. Mary also didn't have children. So it's, it's just a little bit doing the work. Because we all know the golden rule, treat others like you want to be treated, but that's like not the same, like what diversity and inclusion says. Diversity and inclusion, we have treat others not like they want to be treated, not like you want to be treated, but like they want to be treated. So here you, we need to practice curiosity, we need to build relationships with people so that we know how they want to be treated. We won't see it on someone's face, how they want to be treated. You need to, and this goes like corporate culture, who do you go drinking with, and who, you know, and who do you go drinking with, you know more about those people, who do you go for dinner with, lunch with, who are the people in your lunch breaks? And as a leader, you need to make space for everybody in your team to have access to you, so that you have the opportunity to learn about them. Second scenario, how would you behave in this case? Okay, there is a new project at work using LLMs, of course, to improve a workflow. It needs to be done rather quickly. There are some brainstorming meetings and some plannings, and the manager has to determine who will work on this. Now, in this case, you are the manager, and in this case, you are also super excited about the topic. Unlike some other managers who are not excited about the topic, in this case, you are excited about the topic. Even if you're not excited about LLMs, pretend that you are for the sake of this example. <laughs> okay, so James, and maybe this has happened to you before, James has already an idea and goes home and over the weekend builds it as a prototype and comes back on Monday and tells the team, I've done it, I have the prototype, you guys can put it in production. This is super efficient now. Has this happened to anybody? Were you motivated to put that thing in production? <laughs> Yeah, so sadly, this happens more often than not, right? The role of a leader is not really to work on the cool stuff at work and take it away from the team, because working on the cool stuff, the challenging stuff, is the way to grow in your role, and that should be, I mean, you want your employees to grow, right? Mary is, of course, doing um, some brainstorming. She's meeting, uh, brainstorming meetings. She makes sure that everybody states their opinion. And... So she probably had some training about how to conduct meetings. And she's also, at the end of the meeting, she's making sure that um, 
the scope and the problem fits, the timeline and the team's availability. That's kind of all you have to do as a leader. You don't have to build it yourself. Unless, of course, you're... So, in Germany, we also have sometimes quite a lot of... Often, someone is head of a department, but it's only one person. And then that person, of course, can build it, has to build it. The rule of thumb here is to try not to go to meetings with your mind made up. This is really hard. We all have a lot of opinions, and in 2024, we are used to confusing opinions for facts. And that, if your opinion is in your head a fact, and it's a very real fact for you, it is really impossible for the people in the room to convince you otherwise. It's a lot of work. And maybe your idea is not really the best. It's, because if it were, you would already be a billionaire, right? I mean, if you were just the person with all these good ideas. So, so this is a lot of work that we all have to put in because this is not, this is just, you know, it's so human to have an opinion about everything and to say like, okay, my opinion, I will keep it to myself and I see maybe I'm getting surprised I learned something new in the meeting today and I'm super curious about what everybody in the team has to say. Okay, the next scenario is even more fun. Okay, so one woman employee comes to their manager and asks for a promotion. The manager is a bit surprised. It's always a surprise when promotions happen, right? People ask for promotions. So they don't have a good answer. The first thing that comes to mind is asking the employee about her family planning and how that would interfere with the extra responsibility. I, like, I could ask here who has had situations like this or similar. Um, maybe I don't. After a while, the employee decides to give her manager feedback. So you are the manager. If someone comes to you and gives you feedback about this, what would you say? M mistakes happen. You might you know, say something illegal at work. It happens. Okay, so James says, oh, I'm sorry that you, le that you felt offended, but I didn't mean it as a discrimination. Actually, to be honest, I have the same conversation also with the male employees when they ask for a promotion. It's a valid excuse. While Mary, of course, honestly, Mary probably wouldn't say anything about family planning, because who cares, unless you're working at a family planning company, and it's like, she would say, oh, you're right, I've overstepped, and we need to report this to HR, is it okay with you? I'd like to invite someone from HR to help me do this right. Because this is, I mean, in Germany, this is illegal to ask anybody such private things and connect them to their work performance. But we've seen it happen, right? People say, they go on sabbatical and then they don't get promoted or they don't go a get a raise. They get pregnant. For guys, it's a little bit easier to pretend they're not pregnant. I mean, when their wife is pregnant or their partner is pregnant, they keep it a secret until like two weeks before it happens. And then they're like, oh, by the way, I need parental leave. I'm gonna ask here who here has kept the pregnancy of their partner a secret for a very long time at work, if anybody, yeah. That was a privilege. That is really a privilege that you can keep a pregnancy a secret, because it's not showing. And it happens. But the important thing here is, as the manager in this equation, who is trying to be better, is to acknowledge the fact that you will make mistakes. We all will make mistakes. Inclusive leadership is a path of lifelong learning, so you need to be accountable and own your mistakes. And you need to learn and practice apologizing. We are not born good at apologizing. Apologizing does not come as a natural life skill. The natural life skill that comes is blaming someone else, at least for me. And don't be afraid to try again. The thing that I tell myself in most situations when apologizing is that the intention doesn't matter, only the outcome does. If you do not own the outcome first, 
You cannot actually build a relationship of trust where you can get to a point where you can say, oh, actually my intention was this, and then that person would even believe you. So think about stepping on someone else's shoes, and the first thing we say is like, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Like, it starts with the little things where we go for the intention, what we meant, and so on. We learn a lot of things when we go for inclusive leadership training, um, being self-aware, stop projecting our own values on other people, understanding um, our perception and how we react to other people and not let that control us. Understand how others work and what their needs are makes us better able to decide with the team for the team. And we also learn not to confuse our own worldview with the real worldview. There is no real worldview. Everybody's view of the world is shaped by their experiences in life. So unless you are a twin, forever staying together, you will not li most likely not have the same worldview. And making space for others, not being the first to share your opinion in, and answer a question in a meeting. That is something that Jeff Bezos was saying, like, speak last. He was right. Get the junior to speak first. Maybe they will ask not a stupid question, but a revealing question that reveals something that none of the seniors is ever thinking about anymore. How can you learn inclusive leadership? There's a lot of ways to learn it. There's one model that I like. It's from Megan Pollock. Pollock and um, it starts with the individual. You learn about yourself. And then the lens, you learn about how you look at the world. And you start noticing discrimination. You start noticing what other people have as barriers that you don't have. Then you start practicing, making mistakes, practice, practice. And then you enjoy the outcomes. You have like cultural, intelligent communication, inclusive collaboration, and you are successful in innovating and building cool stuff. And it might look like it's super easy. It might look to James that it's like this, but life is rarely like this. I think it's more like this. We kind of go through thinking we are totally unaware. We think we've been awesome our whole lives. We've been doing everything right. We haven't offended anybody, and we've already no problems anywhere. And then something happens, like, for example, this talk. We wake up, and we realize, oh, we've done that. Mm, OK. And we start like researching, learning about ourselves, learning about others. And then we are like super ashamed about some things we've said in the past, some jokes we made when we then said, sorry, it's just a joke. And, and then we start being active, experimenting, and trying to make mistakes and change the world and learn from the mistakes. If you don't, you, you're accountable for your mistakes, you're like, oh, I made a mistake, now I know how to do it better. And the, the trick about this is that this is a multidimensional <laughs> journey, and it kind of happens kind of for any kind of identity that you might, might have out there. It happens for your gender, for your race, for your religion, for your physical ability, sexual orientation, technical skill, hierarchy, age. We, are, we have so many biases and so many things that we need to understand how they are controlling our thought process, our decision-making process. And if we want to be in control of our lives, we need to you know, start acknowledging that. And as Carol said yesterday, walk your own path. Be mindful that inclusivity in a company is sustainable if rooted in the country's culture, ethics, and values. So, it's, so for you to be an inclusive leader in a country where that is not a thing is going to be not very sustainable. And probably you have to start small with your team. And so think about all the things you heard today, and maybe not everything applies to you in the same way. And why should you care? So for the old and new allies in the room, the last part of research that I'm going to say is about the fact that when marginalized people work to increase diversity, supervise them, give them worse performance evaluations. 
Whereas for people who have privilege, when they do that, it doesn't hurt their performance and sometimes even improves it. So you can only gain, everybody here can only gain. And if still not convinced, there's a leadership revolution happening and it's ine inevitable. It has happened before, this is a real, real Mary. She was one of the, she was Mary Cassatt, was an American painter living in Paris and became the 19th century most modern Ameri painter. America's most modern painter. She was in France, like all the Impressionists, and a woman, and one in three women, and the only American, and she was tired about all the conservative painters that were like, oh, our French school of art is the best, and so on. And she decided to push for doing her whole life like art differently, and was successful. And well, everybody, I mean, we would all love an Impressionist painting in our house, like a real one, but modern paintings are probably what we get now. So it works, and you can be part of it, and you don't have to be the CEO. You can be anybody. So thank you very much for listening to my talk today. This talk is possible because Jessica um, has helped me a lot, and also Galina Mitricheva and Mary Bayorek gave me a lot of help. So stay in touch. and. Um, Hope you're hyped now by inclusive leadership and you wanna be this amazing person. I see it as self-optimization. Like, you wanna be successful, this is the fastest way. Control your brain to get, you know, it's like, yeah, anyways, I'm done.